This presentation uses terminology that appears in federal disability rights laws enacted between 1970 and 1990. As a result, parts of this discussion may not reflect person-first language that is more frequently used today. We present terms like drug addiction and alcoholism as examples of physical or mental impairments that specifically appear in these laws. We want to recognize that this language can be stigmatizing for people with substance use or alcohol use disorders. Hello, and thank you for joining the HHS Office for Civil Rights for part two of the Exploring Civil Rights Protections for Individuals in Recovery from an Opioid Use Disorder. My name is Carla Carter, and I am a supervisory civil rights analyst with the Office for Civil Rights. Before we get started, I want to give you some background information about the Office for Civil Rights, also known as OCR. OCR is a law enforcement agency within the United States Department of Health and Human Services that is responsible for ensuring compliance with certain civil rights, conscience and religious freedom, and health information, privacy, and security laws. OCR investigates complaints, conducts compliance reviews, promulgates policy and regulation, and provides technical assistance and public education for the American people. We have offices located throughout the United States, including Washington, DC. To learn more about OCR, please check out the resource page at the end of part one and part two of this presentation. Part one of the webinar, Disability Discrimination in the Child Welfare System, answered frequently asked questions by members of the child welfare community, such as, who is protected by disability non-discrimination laws? What covered entities must comply with these laws? And which child welfare programs, services, and activities are subject to non-discrimination requirements? Part one also provided an overview of Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 and Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. And we learned how these laws protect qualified individuals with a disability. Part two of the webinar, Federal Disability Right Protections for Individuals in Recovery from an opioid use disorder, we'll focus on the three prongs of the definition of disability, answer the question, is drug addiction considered a disability? Explore exceptions within federal disability rights laws and address protections for individuals receiving medication assisted treatment, also known as MED. In this section, you will learn how an individual may establish coverage under any of the three prongs of the definition of disability. The actual disability prong, the record of prong, and the regarded as prong. Let's turn our attention to the actual disability prong. Coverage under the actual disability prong requires a showing of a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity or major bodily function. For a refresher on what is a physical or mental impairment and examples of major life activities and major bodily functions, Please review part one of the webinar, beginning at slide 21. Here are a few examples of an actual disability. Low vision substantially limits the major life activity of seeing. Diabetes substantially limits endocrine function, which is a major bodily function, and cancer substantially limits normal self growth which is also a major bodily function. The determination of whether an impairment substantially limits a major life activity or major bodily function 
requires an individualized assessment and the term substantially limits should be construed broadly in favor of expansive coverage. The record of prong protects individuals who have recovered from a physical or mental impairment that previously substantially limited them in a major life activity or major bodily function. Discrimination on the basis of a past impairment is prohibited. Examples of individuals with a past impairment include those with a history of heart disease, cancer, and emotional illness. The record of prong also protects individuals misclassified as having a physical or mental impairment, such as an intellectual disability or a mental health condition. Some examples of records that can establish an impairment include school records, medical records, military records, and employment records. Under the regarded as prong, an individual is subjected to a prohibited action because of an actual or perceived physical or mental impairment, whether the impairment limits or is perceived to limit a major life activity or major bodily function. Here's an example. A parent would be covered under the regarded as prong if the parent was denied reunification opportunities based on the mistaken belief that the parent has a mental impairment that limits his or her ability to benefit from the services of a child welfare program. I'll give you another example. A parent would be covered under the regarded as prong if the parent was denied visitation with a child because the parent receives methadone for an opioid addiction. As we discussed in part one, drug addiction is a recognized impairment under federal disability rights law. Do federal disability rights laws protect individuals with alcoholism? The answer is, it depends. Alcoholism, like other forms of addiction, is an impairment. However, to meet the definition of a disability, the impairment must substantially limit a major life activity. Is an addiction to drugs an impairment? The answer is yes. Drug addiction is a physical or mental impairment recognized by federal disability rights law. The question of whether an addiction is a disability comes up frequently in OCR's work. Is an addiction to drugs a disability under federal disability rights laws? Well, it depends. Here's the inquiry. Does the addiction substantially limit a major life activity? Does the individual have a record of an, of an addiction to drugs? Or has the individual been subjected to a prohibited action because of an actual or perceived addiction? Depending upon the answers, the individual may be protected under federal disability rights laws. Federal disability rights laws do not protect someone who is currently engaged in the illegal use of drugs when the covered entity acts on the basis of that use. The illegal use of drugs means the use of drugs, the possession or distribution of which is unlawful under the Controlled Substances Act. The illegal use of drugs may include using a controlled substance, which is not prescribed to the individual, misuse of a controlled substance, or using a controlled substance obtained by a fraudulent prescription. Current drug use means 
the illegal use of drugs occurred recently enough to justify a reasonable belief that a person's drug use is current. Here's an example. A newborn exhibiting withdrawal symptoms resulting from prenatal exposure to cocaine is removed from his mother based on the mother's recent use of the drug. The mother under these circumstances may not be protected under federal disability rights laws because of her use of an illegal drug. A person's participation or completion of a drug treatment program will bring them closer to qualifying for coverage under federal disability rights laws. However, the individual must also be no longer engaging in drug use for a sufficient amount of time for that drug use to be considered no longer a, an ongoing pro problem. <clears throat> Here's a question. What about the use of marijuana in a state where it is legal? Section 504 in the ADA refer to illegal drug use under federal law. The fact that the use of marijuana is legal in some states does not mean that a person is not engaged in the illegal use of drugs under federal law. The illegal use of drugs does not include the use of a drug taken under supervision, under the supervision of a licensed healthcare professional or for other uses authorized by the Controlled Substances Act or other provisions of law. Here's an example. A parent may be prescribed methadone to treat an opioid use disorder. If the parent is taking methadone as prescribed, he or she would not be engaged in the illegal use of drugs. Federal disability rights laws also protect individuals who have successfully completed a supervised drug rehabilitation program and are no longer engaging in the illegal use of drugs or have otherwise been rehabilitated successfully and are no longer engaging in such use or are participating in a supervised rehabilitation program and are no longer engaging in such use or are erroneously regarded as engaging in such use but are not engaging in such use. Here's an example. A father seeking reunification with his children has successfully completed a substance use disorder treatment program and random screens indicate he is no longer engaged in the illegal use of drugs. The father under these circumstances may be protected under federal disability rights. Covered entities are not prohibited from drug testing designed to ensure that a person who formerly engaged in the illegal use of drugs is no longer currently engaged in the illegal use of drugs. In other words, federal disability rights laws do not prohibit a covered entity from conducting drug testing. Covered entities are prohibited from denying health services or services provided in connection with drug rehabilitation to an individual on the basis of that individual's current illegal use of drugs if the individual is otherwise entitled to such services. It should be noted that even though a drug program cannot refuse admission to a person on the basis that that person is currently engaged in the illegal use of drugs, they can prohibit participants from engaging in the illegal use of drugs once, they're, once they are admitted to treatment. In other words, a drug treatment program can require abstinence 
as a condition of participation in the program and may terminate a participant from the program for engaging in the illegal use of drugs without violating federal disability rights law. Medication assisted treatment or MAD is the use of medications in combination with counseling and mental health therapies to provide a whole patient approach to the treatment of substance use disorders. MAD has proven effective in treating alcohol and opioid use disorders and the medications are approved by the Food and Drug Administration. Before we explore protections for individuals receiving medication assisted treatment or MAT, please take a moment to review the three medications commonly used to treat opioid addiction disorders. Methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. An individual's receipt of MAT is not the illegal use of drugs when MAT is taken under the supervision of a licensed healthcare professional. If an individual receives MAT from an opioid use disorder and is also currently engaged in the illegal use of drugs, the individual is not protected by Section 504 or the ADA in most circumstances. Also, if the individual misuses his or her MAT prescription, the illegal use of drugs may have occurred. The determination of whether an individual receiving MAT is entitled to federal disability rights protections is a fact-specific inquiry. Let's walk through the steps. Is the person receiving MAT an individual with a disability? We're gonna think back to the inquiry for determining who is an individual with a disability. Is the person receiving MAT a qualified individual with a disability? In other words, does the person receiving MAT meet the essential eligibility requirements of the program or activity he or she is seeking to participate in. Child welfare agencies may not assume that a parent receiving MAT poses a threat to a child based on assumptions that the MAT participants are likely to relapse, are unable to care for themselves, or are likely to be associated with crime. Decisions related to child safety must be based on an individualized assessment of the parent with a disability based on reasonable judgment that relies on current medical knowledge or the best available objective evidence to ascertain the nature, duration, and severity of the risk to the child and the probability that the potential injury to the child will actually occur and whether reasonable modifications of policies, practices, or procedures or the provisions of auxiliary aids and services will mitigate the risk. We've come to the end of our presentation please feel free to visit any of the links on this page to get more information about the opioid epidemic and HHS's response. Thank you. Email OCR at ocrmail at hhs.gov. Mailing address, Centralized Case Management Operations, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, 200 Independence Avenue Southwest, Room 509F, HHH Building, Washington, D.C. 20201. Call OCR toll-free at 800-368-1019 
or TDD toll-free at 800-537-7697. To file a complaint, visit https colon forward slash forward slash OCR portal dot HHS dot gov forward slash OCR forward slash smart screen forward slash main dot JSF. This presentation was supported by contract number HHSS 2702017-00001C from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, co-funded by Children's Bureau, CB, and the Administration on Children, Youth, and Families, ACYF. The views, opinions, and content of this presentation are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of SAMHSA, ACYF, or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, HHS. Contact the National Center on Substance Abuse and Child Welfare at ncsacw at cffutures.org or visit https colon forward slash forward slash ncsacw dot samsa dot gov.